It's time for Real Ag Radio on Rural Radio Channel 147 on Sirius XM. Real Ag Radio and realagriculture.com is your home for insight and analysis of the issues that are impacting your farm business. Let's get real and get connected with Real Ag Radio. Welcome everyone to Real Egg Radio here on Rural Radio Channel 147. I am your host, Lindsay Smith. Well, I am your host for today because today is Tuesday and it's Tuesdays with Lindsay. I'm absolutely enjoying being on the radio uh, more regularly. I'm really enjoying being able to have a lot of these conversations and share them with you. Um, and thank you so much for each and every one of you for sharing your feedback. Uh, been getting lots of it. I really appreciate it. If you want to zip me an email, lsmith at realagriculture.com. Please do that. Okay. So it is uh, what I like to call sweater weather if anybody knows the reference. Beautiful, cool temps overnight, lovely, warm summer days, or summer-like, I guess. And this is exactly what I'm built for. I am not someone who loves heat. I love fall. I love these cool temps. Uh, It is making me very happy. Now, of course, uh, for many of you in Ontario, you would prefer that the nights weren't quite so cool and that the days were a wee bit warmer as we still have quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of room to go on the corn crop. Soybeans are coming along quite nicely though uh, and I will say and yes I know we're in the critical harvest period but we've actually had quite a bit of hay made in the last little while here because we've got some dry weather for once. We had quite a wet season. Okay. Um, also this week and uh, wanted to share and certainly is probably something that many of you have been a part of if you've been a part of 4-H either as a kid or bringing your kids through or maybe you're part of your county fair. Uh, this past weekend, my daughter, my oldest, uh, showed her sheep in uh, her achievement day this weekend and got to do something really cool and I wanted to share. Um, I had never seen hogs being shown before. It blows my mind. It's basically chaos. Um, but uh, she had a chance to have her hand at showing a hog as something called a showmanship showdown, where the winners of different uh, showmanship classes got to compete, and they had to show animals other than the species that they tend to show. So they, so my daughter learned how to show a rabbit, a dairy cow, a beef cow, horses, and hogs. Absolutely so much fun. Hats off to, uh, to our 4-H group for putting that, all that together at our local fair. It was a lot of fun. It was really cool. So, uh, pretty neat. Um, and I will, but I will share for all of you who show hogs, uh, my daughter is not doing that again. She did not have a great time. It is something to see. Let me tell you. Okay. Uh, on with the show though. Okay. So today's show, kind of a neat one. I got to tell you, we're going to focus on, uh, stubble and grazing, sort of. And let me explain. So, so one of the things that I'm really proud to share is uh, the most recent episode of Profitable Practices. That's a video series here on Real Agriculture. And it happens to feature uh, Chris Moore, who is my partner, and myself with Bern Tobin. So stick around. That's right after the break. I've also got a fascinating discussion with Philip Harder. He's with the University of Saskatchewan. And he maps out the importance of snow melt on eventual yield. And he's got some really cool findings from this past growing season season on canola especially, that really outline why stubble, which captures snow, and why soil structure plays such a key role in eventual yields, especially in dry conditions. So super duper conversation. Really looking forward to that one. And then um, we do have a clip with Johanna Lindboom uh, from Clark Agri-Services and Doug Moisey from Corteva. They joined me just a few weeks ago on The Agronomist, and I decided to pull some of the clips from that discussion on the stories that stubble tell. Uh, so stick around for that. And then at the end of the show, there are a few key things I want to tackle uh, when it comes to some news items. So there's a few things going on and of course, a few upcoming deadlines that I want to make sure everybody is aware of. All right. So with that, let's get to a break and then we'll come back with uh, what are we doing first? We're going to do profitable practices first. All right. We'll be back with that right after this. It's now time for a product spotlight with the Canadian Canola Growers Association. We're joined right now by Dave Gallant. Dave, for anyone who is unfamiliar with the cash advance from CCGA, give give us a bit of a brief overview on the program and and how it really works to help farmers. It gives them access to cash flow 
for their inventory before they have to sell that inventory. There's no fee and farmers have access to $350,000 interest free and another $650,000 of prime minus three quarters of a percent on over 55 different products. So it really assists farmers with their working capital needs, especially now in the fall. And lastly, farmers only have to pay a cash advance as they sell the product. So there's no monthly or quarterly payments required, which means they only pay when they have cash flow from a sale. Farmers can apply right now. Uh, if they are not an existing customer, they simply call us at one 866 745 2256. Looking for robust, reliable grain storage solutions? AGI leads the industry in quality, innovation, and offerings to protect your investment. Designed for exceptional cleanout, superior strength, and unbeatable versatility, you can rest easy knowing your grain is secure in an AGI West Steel bin. With 100 years of manufacturing experience, AGI West Steel bins will exceed your expectations for reliable storage. AGI West Steel, long term safe storage. Find AGI at your local dealer. Back to Real Ag Radio here on Rural Radio Channel 147. I am your host for the day, Lindsay Smith. It is Tuesdays with Lindsay. Come back every Tuesday. You'll hear me. All right. This segment is brought to you by Co-op. Your Co-op Grow Team stays up to date with the latest research and technology to help support your entire operation. Talk to our team for advice tailored to your farm's needs. Co-op. Here for your farm. Here for your family. Learn more at co-op.crs slash farm. All right. We have several different series here on Real Agriculture. In case you haven't noticed, we are very busy people. We have a team across Canada. We also, most of us also farm. And as part of that, sometimes we get to be in front of the camera, not just behind it. So one of the series that we have here on Real Agriculture is called Profitable Practices. It's a video series. You can find it on YouTube. You can find it at realagriculture.com. And what we've been doing, uh, it's sponsored by, I should say, RBC and Farm Credit Canada. That's important because we've been going across Canada, catching up with farmers who are already doing some pretty amazing things that happen to be incredibly environmentally responsible or a benefit to the environment and also profitable. What is that? That's the definition of sustainability. And I know people don't love that word, but it's really important when we talk about what makes a farm pass to the next generation. It's it's definitely going to be the people. It's definitely going to be your soil and your water and your air, but it's got to pay the bills or there's nothing there. So that is profitable practices in a nutshell. We're highlighting farmers across Canada that have found a way to continue their farm with maybe a bit of a unique twist, but also doing something that maybe a lot of other people are doing already. Now, this brings me to our latest episode in which you hear from yours truly. So for those of you who have followed the show for a while or who know me from Twitter or frankly know me in person, love you all, uh, we have a sheep farm here in the Ottawa Valley and uh, we raise our sheep a little bit differently. So we, yes, we are a grazing operation, but we do solar grazing. And I'm sure I'll get feedback about this and I would welcome it and I love it. Uh, but we use our sheep to do vegetation abatement at solar sites. So these are commercial solar power installations. Uh, the particular site that we're on in this interview is 200 acres. Our sheep move in in the spring and stay there all year munching on the vegetation to help keep the panels clear. I'll leave it to the profitable practice episode to sort of explain it all. Uh, but here you go. Here's Bern Tobin talking with me, Lindsay Smith, and of course, my partner, Chris Moore, uh, in the latest episode of Profitable Practices. Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin. Welcome to Profitable Practices. Today, I'm near Kinburn, Ontario, right here in the city limits of Ottawa, where I'm catching up with Chris Moore and Lindsay Smith from Shady Creek Lamb Company. On this episode, we're going to learn about solar grazing and how they've turned it into a profitable practice on their farm. Chris and Lindsay, tell us about your farm operation. Give us a snapshot. So we are Shady Creek Lamb Company. Uh, we raise a large flock within Ottawa city limits. Uh, we raise our sheep a bit differently. We raise them in solar sites doing uh, solar grazing, and we sell our lamb and our wool in the Ottawa area. Now feeding animals is a huge part of livestock production and a key to profitability. Tell us about your approach. About five years ago, we decided if we were gonna make a living sheep farming, we were gonna need more acres for feed, and for manure management, we got started with a local solar site that's about 200 acres. We are now over 
almost at a thousand acres of solar that we're responsible for vegetation abatement at. And once the solars are done for the season, we will switch to cover crops at some cash crop farms in the area. Tell us more about solar grazing. You know, what was the strategy? What were you hoping to achieve? So solar grazing is an, is an interesting way to feed sheep for sure in that we are actually paid to graze a solar site. So instead of using tractors and mowers, our sheep are employed to clear out the vegetation underneath and in front of the panels. And it really, it was a way to expand our land base without having to take on the debt of buying land or potentially even trying to rent land for hay ground. So it really required a complete sort of rethink of our entire production system. Um, and we brought sheep here in the fall of 2017 for a pilot project. Uh, the company was happy with what we did. We were happy with how the sheep did. And so we started full time in 2018, uh, not only bringing the sheep in in early May to start grazing, but also to lamb here. And so we've changed our entire production system to, uh, to keep the sheep on grass as long as possible, uh, including cover cropping after we're done here at the solar in about October and, uh, and carrying it right through. So it's been, it's been a way that we've actually been able to triple the size of our flock without having to take on extra debt. Tell us about how grazing at the solar site works. Give us the nuts and bolts. Um, on this site, it's approximately 200 acres, 23 megawatts, and produces enough electricity for 7,000 homes. We have 450 ewes approximately here with lambs, five guardian dogs, and um, we are moving the sheep daily, and we are using electric mesh fences because there's ewes with lambs. And other sites, we might only use the electric reels. We have two solar energizers powering these fences. The grazing season typically starts early May, end of April. We will go up until October, sometimes as late as November. Um, water is on site, but we do haul it around the site using big water tanks, and we have water totes in some pastures and other areas operate off a of float. We should also mention, so one of the big challenges with solar grazing is, is certainly the fencing. Um, they do need to do a really good job of removing the vegetation in front of those panels, under the panels, and so we do have to cross fence. We move them, as Chris said, every day, maybe every two days, um, and so that's a huge labor component, and that has been a, a big consideration for making this really work, is, is figuring out that labor component and making sure the sheep stay healthy and do a good job. How do you measure success? From a sustainability perspective, what benefits are you seeing on the farm? So success for us, I think, is, is certainly caring for our sheep, first and foremost, making sure that they're healthy and productive. But it's also about being able to run a business and being able to be economically viable. And so solar grazing offers another income stream, which has been really important, especially you know, during those summer months while the lambs are growing and we're, we're not making sales per se. But one of the biggest things that certainly we're very proud of here at the solar site and the other solars that we run on is the biodiversity and the habitat that uh, managed grazing really encourages. We've got, um, as you can see here, we've got a, just a whole bunch of milkweed and a really diverse amount of plants. There's always something flowering. There's honeybees on site. Uh, we find some really fascinating insects and birds living in the site and it's really alive. and. Uh, we're really proud about that. Um, we're proud that, you know, for this area, there's a lot of corn and beans, and this provides 200 acres right in the middle of all that of ground cover, of flowering plants. That's really important to the habitat here. How does solar grazing impact the profitability of your farm? So solar grazing can really change the, the profit dynamic, especially for a sheep farm. Uh, we know that we can raise lamb very affordably because we have grazing, we have a lot of grazing, but also we're paid to graze it. So we know that we can raise a lamb uh, efficiently in a cost-effective way. And so it does buffer us against potentially, you know, drops in lamb prices, those sorts of things. We know there's lots of demand for lamb. That's not the problem. Um, but certainly with high feed costs or high overhead, it can be pretty tough to make a profit. And so this really helps us keep our costs down per lamb. Any advice for farmers who want to tackle an innovative project like this? Probably the first thing would be recognizing your worth, recognizing the worth of other professionals around you, um, and investing in those sorts of things is really important. Being um, 
it's something that's mainstream enough that there's risk management or insurance to help cover you is kind of a good plan, I think. Um, and be ready to make a mistake and learn. What's next for Shady Creek Lamb and solar grazing? So uh, what's next is, is a really great question. We, we have grown very quickly. We are learning every year. I don't know that we've had a production year yet that has been the same as the year before. So I think that there's a, there's a lot of sense in trying to be better before going even bigger. At the same time, there's an incredible demand uh, for solar grazing, for vegetation abatement, and, and sheep are incredibly well suited for it. So uh, we are going to keep doing this and, and probably keep growing every year. All right. If you would like to watch that video or any of the videos, and I will say we've got some excellent drone footage in this video, head on over to our YouTube channel. You can subscribe. We are Real Agriculture. Go find us there. And you can, of course, see all of the episodes in that series and all the other videos we do, too. So go check it out. Of course, I, I, I know full well, and we deal with it all the time, that solar installations don't always have the best reputation. And for good reason, I understand what some of the concerns are. But we found a way to make a solar site work for us and keep that land in food production. I know it's controversial. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. If you're seeing solar grazing happening where you are, by the way, there's a name, it's called Agrivoltaics. It's the combination of solar panels and food production. Uh, would love to hear your thoughts. L Smith at realagriculture.com. Or of course, you can find us on social media at Real Agriculture. Zip us a DM. I know I, I I have these conversations online many times about some of the myths and some of the concerns about solar installations. I'm not saying they're perfect, but we have definitely found a way to keep that land in food production. And honestly, in a dry year, it's actually better than some of the bulb pasture that we have that has no shade. So there you go. Okay, uh, I'll get off my soapbox on that one. And you may sense a theme with today's episode as we're going to go from grazing. Now we're going to talk about capturing snow melt on fields. And then we're going to talk a little bit more about stubble after that. So stick with me. We're going to take a quick break and I'll be back with Philip Harder talking about capturing snow melt right after this. What's next for your fields? At Pioneer, delivering industry-leading genetics drives everything we do. From the scientists in the lab to our local teams with boots on the ground, we are determined to get there first. Developing top-performing products, proven in more growing conditions than ever before. Pioneer. What's next happens here. Visit pioneer.com slash Canada to learn more. You know, there's a reason we call it the corn school. Videos on everything from planter setup, weed control, field trial results, yield strategies, and so much more. The corn school on realagriculture.com has the information and advice you need to help you succeed. Brought to you by Pride Seeds and BASF, corn school episodes are available at cornschool.com, from realagriculture.com, or as a podcast from your favorite streaming service. Download the latest podcast today. Introducing the all-new Zerion 12 Series Tractor by Kloss. Redesigned from the ground up to redefine the high-capacity four-wheel drive market. With 653 max horsepower, industry-leading hydraulic flow, a silky smooth CVT, a powerful TerraTrack undercarriage, and a quiet, comfortable cab with 20% more legroom. More than just power. The all-new Zerion by Kloss. Welcome back to Real Ag Radio here on this Tuesday. I am your host, Lindsay Smith, and this segment is brought to you by Workplace Safety and Prevention Services. Health and safety doesn't have to be complicated. Tune in to the new Farm Safety Roundup series coming soon right here on Real Agriculture. On the very first episode, you will hear about free resources and practical advice for harvest season and rural road safety. Okay, safety, super important. You know what else is super important? Rainfall. But what happens when you don't have rainfall? Snow melt. Yes, the answer to your problems is snow melt. Okay, I might be blowing it out of proportion. But now we're going to have a conversation on quantifying the importance of trapping snow and making sure that that snow melt infiltrates into your soil and just what kind of impact that can have on crop yield. 
All right. Joining me now is Philip Harder. He's a research associate with the University of Saskatchewan focused on hydrology. So focused on water. Philip, uh, Saskatchewan, of course, in my mind, uh, is there anything more important than water in Saskatchewan? I don't think so. Well, I'm pretty biased, but uh, yeah, I think it's pretty pretty big component of what we uh, need to deal with when it comes to agriculture. Yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, no, we're we're a water limited environment generally. There's obviously regional variability, but you know, you look at the crop yield patterns versus precipitation patterns, and they match up fairly well. Yep, absolutely. Okay. And that is sort of part of the reason we're talking today is I caught one of your threads on, on Twitter X, um, about the importance or the difference that capturing and filtering in of snowmelt made on crop yield. So, so set this up for me. Walk me through. Uh, this is particularly on canola, but what, what were you looking at here and what were your findings? Okay. So yeah, we've got a number of sites that we, we tend to, what we're trying to do is just basically monitor crop water use and at the end of the day, trying to figure out where it's coming from, um, how much is being used and all that. Uh, so, you know, this one particular site, um, it's near Saskatoon here. Uh, so yeah, we had a fairly large snowpack this past year, um, probably from our observations is that, that go back about seven years at this particular place. Um, this was the largest snowpack we've had. Uh, and yeah, in come springtime, it, we had very high infiltration. There was a little bit of meltwater runoff into sort of local depressions, but nothing, you know, left the field. Um, and yeah, then fast forward, we had a really quite a hot spring, um, in May and it didn't really rain all that much thereafter. And so, yeah, and at the end of the day, we had um, during the growing season, you know, 60 millimeters, just, just over two inches of rain, yet the plants obviously still grew. Um, and so, yeah, one of the other, comp- one of the instruments we have out there, it's, it's called eddy covariance. Uh, and so what this allows us to is just measure actually how much crop water use there is the, the total evapotranspiration over the course of the season. And so, you know, pulling the data from it and looking at it, it's like, well, uh, we had, you know, there, I still have to do a bunch more quality control on the data, but I'm confident enough to say that, you know, there's around 110 millimeters of crop water use, which doesn't really line up with the 60 millimeters of rainfall. Right. And yeah, going back and looking, well, where would that difference have come from? And, um, you know, we had a large snowpack, things were dry, we didn't see a lot of runoff at all. So really at the end of the day, that difference in crop water use from our uh, available precipitation, the rainfall during the season really highlights how much did come from snow. Um, Mm -hmm. There's other processes going on, but at the end of the day, you know, over half of the water that the canola did use at this particular site would be from, you know, snow processes and stuff outside of the growing season. Which, so there's a few things that, that come to mind is, I mean, obviously we have no control over snowpack, um, unfortunately. And yes and no. Yes uh, and no. Okay. But, but (laughs) we have exactly, we have control over holding that snow. Yes. And so, so how important is, is that and, and how much residue or stubble, how much is enough to actually trap Mm. snow? Uh, it, yeah, it, it varies, right? So we don't change how much snowfall we get. And so if you're in a low snow year, it doesn't really matter what you do, um, in terms of your stubble. If there's no snow to capture, there's no snow to capture. Um, but yeah, in, in the situations where there is snow, um, you know, you, you know, the other work that I've done previously, you know, on average, you know, if you, your, your benefits, start sort of waning after you have a 30 centimeter tall stubble height. But that really is context specific. Um, Mm. We had a lot of snow this year. Um, So we had 110 millimeters of water equivalent in the field. So, uh, you know, around four inches of water in the snowpack. Um, We could have probably captured more if we had taller stubble in this situation than 30 centimeters. Right. Um, so it really, it really matters on how much snow there is to begin with. But, um, you know, no matter how 
dry things are, there generally is some sort of snow. And so yeah, any stubble um, will, will help. Um, that scenario. So now the, there's the other part to this too, though, and that's the infiltration part mm-hmm. in that, yes. uh, right? In that frozen soil doesn't absorb yeah. water. Um, yeah. So, so we can't necessarily decide if we get a slow melt or a fast melt, mm-hmm. uh, but mm-hmm. are there things that, or are there observations you've made between fields on the infiltration process of whether or not we can influence how much? Yeah, um, that's a really tricky one. Um, and we, we don't, we, the way our experiments have been set up, we haven't really been going after that specific question, but we have information that definitely sheds light on it. Um, it frozen soil is really difficult. Um, there's a couple factors in play where, yeah, you could be in a scenario where nothing gets in. Um, or in this past year, yeah, we had frozen snow, uh, frozen soils, I mean. Uh, but things were, um, it didn't freeze very well because it was dry to begin with. And we went from, you know, unfrozen open ground to just covered by a thick snowpack. So things, we did have a very high infiltration capacity, right. even though it was, you know, frozen. So some years, if you have, you know, a deep snowpack, um, that doesn't really have into winter melts that might lead to, you know, frozen layer of water forming at your soil surface. Um, those things can kind of impede that. Um, but yeah, some years, especially in heavy snow years, there are, it does predispose it that you still can get a lot in. Mm-hmm. Um, there's things you can do, um, you know, things like uh, maintaining more residue um, that definitely like you know creates more of an insulation layer um, that doesn't um, uh, that prevents things from freezing really deep for example um, that does help with the infiltration there are little things you can tweak but yeah at the end of the day you know we can trap more snow but if it doesn't go in there are there is limited value from that agronomic perspective mm-hmm. so. now have you looked at differences on pasture or rangeland with perennial cover? Have you looked at sort of how some of this changes? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the site that I'm referencing, so this is observations we have out near Clavette, near Saskatoon here at the Livestock and Forage uh, Center for Excellence, this University of Saskatchewan uh, feedlot that, you know, very much is focused on the forage side of things. And so we have this one field that we, that I'm referring to previously that has sort of annual cropping whether it's like silage or this past year was canola to break up the rotation. Um, but we do also observe these same things on a nearby sort of perennial forage and, you know, very similar patterns this past year, because, you know, we had pretty high infiltration rates on both places. Um, but if you go back to other previous years, a perennial forage with that, you know, it has a very different soil structure that's that evolves in terms of um, the roots that have been developing and are persistent and the macropores that develop accordingly. So we, yeah, we see generally higher infiltration rates on those sites, um, like significantly higher. Uh, in this past year, it was no different because everything went in on both. Um, but in other years, there are differences in your Perennial forages in those frozen soil snowmelt situations definitely do have a higher infiltration rate in those at those mm-hmm. times. I'm biased, of course, because I think everyone should grow more forage, but um, that's just, <laughs> but, but it, it does, it does though, like sort of help us wrap our heads around this interaction between residue cover, snow mm-hmm. trap, but also that key infiltration part, right? Of, yeah when that when that snow melt happens how much can we capture because so mm-hmm. this is i guess maybe my final question on this although i'm pretty sure we could talk all day about it because uh, it's mm-hmm. super cool and you've got some great images on twitter i want to tell everybody and you should share your twitter handle so people can go check it out what was the yield like did you measure yield difference between because the pictures it shows like there's definitely different growth between mm-hmm. As some of the parts like the depressions and and that sort of mm-hmm. stuff in the field, was there a measurable yield difference that you could attribute to potentially that access to water? Um, still working on that data. Um, the other component that we do, so we, yeah, I'm still waiting on the numbers from uh, the uh, the feedlot operators um, to get their yield data. 
Uh, but we also do fly like drones over this area. And so one of the components we do is fly LIDAR. And so we will have, um, once I process that data, uh, you know, fairly good, high quality, high spatial resolution differences in biomass. Yeah. Um, and so we will be able to start, to, you know, connecting those dots. Haven't done that yet, but there, yeah, there's one thing is biomass. The other thing is like that, you know, <laughs> on the dry portions, I don't know if any of those pods really filled with canola. Yeah. Um, walking through that field is pretty, pretty dismal in those spots. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's those, it's still in progress. Um, but yeah, there is definitely yield relationships, um, mm -hmm. that will be described by this for Very sure. Cool. Um, yeah, certainly, you know, hearing this, this particular harvest season is exactly that, especially on some of these crops are just, you know, not, there's nothing there. Um, mm -hmm. and it is really hard to grow a crop on almost no moisture. So uh, mm -hmm. really fascinating to see just, just how much though the, the snow melts uh, can contribute potentially mm -hmm. to, to seasonal on water. And, and to that point you have all winter to crunch the numbers. So, you know, yes. what else? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. So, but very quickly, uh, if you would share your Twitter handles, there, there's some really neat images there that people could look at. Sure. Yeah, no. So it's at harder underscore water. Um, I don't think that which is a great is. handle, by the way. I just want to put it up there. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like it's yeah. Anyway, it's great. Okay, uh, Philip, thank you so much for joining me here. This is a fascinating conversation, and and I do hope it uh, gives at least some people some pause on on maybe going out there and measuring some stubble this fall and seeing how much snow sure. they drop. Good yeah, encouragement. Absolutely, the more you know. <laughs> exactly. There you go. All right, we'll be back with more Real Egg Radio right after this. dedication. Watching the sunset over your crop is one of life's simple pleasures. The anticipation of it all. We know that feeling. Introducing our new Airflex NXT, our best honeybee header yet with the closest cut ever. Light, fast reacting, and infinitely adjustable. More yield, less time, and work. Airflex NXT focuses on the future. What drives your next? Visit honeybee.ca or contact your nearest honeybee dealer. The Advancing Women Conference, the National Leadership Conference for Women in Ag, is celebrating 10 years of bringing women in ag together. Whether you're a producer, student, entrepreneur, representative of Grower Association, or corporate agribusiness, invest in yourself in Niagara Falls on November 19th, 20th, and 21st. Visit advancingwomenconference.ca for more information and to register. Welcome back to Real Ag Radio here on Rural Radio Channel 147. It is Tuesday and I am your host, Lindsay Smith. And this segment is brought to you by Coke Agronomic Services. Imitator stabilizer products claim dual protection, but do they actually deliver? Defend your UAN from nitrogen loss with Tribune Nitrogen Stabilizer from Coke Agronomic Services, offering superior above and below ground protection. See how others stack up at Defend Your N. Ca. All right, we go from how important stubble is for trapping snow and contributing to yield in dry years to the stories that stubble can tell us. So two weeks ago on The Agronomists, which is the live stream I host Monday nights, 8 p.m. Eastern on YouTube, on uh, realagriculture.com slash agronomists, on Twitter, on Facebook, you'll find it to show up 8 p.m. Eastern, Monday nights. I had Johanna Lindeboom with Clark Agri-Services and Doug Moisey with Corteva on the show to talk about what we can learn about the year that happened and potentially plan for the year that is coming by looking at stubble. So now, soybeans, usually we're looking at that leaf drop timing. We're looking more uh, at harvest to see what we can learn from, say, the fungicide pass or maybe our plant density. Uh, but with canola, there's actually a swath timing uh, window where we can learn some disease pressure things. We can start to scout stems. Um, and so we're going to go through that because also then at harvest and post harvest, there are things we can learn. So I grabbed two clips from that show 
show. And I do want to mention, Johanna does refer to a couple slides. Uh, she does describe them very well. So I promise it all works out. But uh, if you are interested in seeing what she's talking about, head over to YouTube uh, or head over to realagriculture.com. And you can, of course, always watch uh, the replay there. All right. Okay. So let's go to a clip from The Agronomist. We're talking about the stories that Stubble tell. All right. So, so tonight, one of the things I kind of want to unpack is, I mean, obviously everything, you get your final answers when you work everything to yield. That makes sense. But there, there are several assessments and observations we can make now or at harvest or post harvest in these fields that tell us a story of how well we did on some things, you know, was the fungicide pass worth it? Um, did we get our plant stand counts? What diseases are we looking at? And Doug, you've alluded to the fact that, especially in canola, we have several that can be confused for a different one. So we're going to unpack some of those. You did mention verticillium stripe or verticillium wilt. Uh, it's a relatively new disease of canola. Uh, are you seeing it in your area for the first time or has it been there for a while, you think? So I think it's been here longer than what we think it has been. It, you know, in the field that I found by Camrose, um, it's just, it was verticillium, and yet we thought it was black lake to begin with. So mm-hmm. it's making its way. I think it's been around longer, and I think it's just been misdiagnosed. I, I think, Doug, you've made a really good point, and that what we thought was black lake maybe for a long time might have been verticillium, and that's what we're starting to look for. Um, it, it is also, I saw just uh, last week, week before, uh, the first case of, of brown stem. Uh, in soybean and because I'm told so I was there with Albert Tenuta so I got quite the lesson um, in this is that it's we have some pretty good genetic uh, resistance to this in in our soybeans Johanna but did you see more of it this year sorry soybean sorry sorry soybean brown stem I haven't seen quite as much of it I saw a lot a couple years ago um, okay. We did see a lot of fusarium in general this year, but I think it could just be an area thing. Um, but it is like they're talking about looking at stems post harvest. I would say almost with soybeans, it's nicer to look at them pre harvest because um, then there's still some living material and it's easier to distinguish one versus another. Um, for me, with brown stem, it's looking at that center pith that usually turns brown versus fusarium or like an SDS. Often it's like the outer vascular tissue that will turn brown and not as dark either, usually more like generally like a light brown discolored. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was, yeah, Tanuta had mentioned that it sudden death syndrome and brown stem can look similar, at least from the leaves. Um, but then when you split the stem, you start to see some differences there as well. And that brown stem it sort of moves from between from node to node. So it sort of sort of hangs out at a node and then makes its way up and then hangs out at a node and keeps going depending, uh, which was really cool. But uh, not surprising that maybe you haven't seen it a lot or at least recently um, in that it, it seems to be something that pops up now and again, but we have pretty good genetic uh, tolerance, resistance, whatever you want to call it to it. So not necessarily a disease of economic concern, but this all brings us full circle to the importance of identifying what is actually happening. So to your point, Doug, about actually figuring out whether it's black leg or verticillium or if it's sudden death or if it's soybean cyst nematode, um, all those different things. So, Johanna, you've actually got some slides that I'd love to touch on some of them because you've got some really great images here. Uh, maybe if we go, if we start on, we can start slide two, I guess, if we, if you want to. Um, root rot was definitely a huge concern this year. How long has this, did the actual sort of impact of it persist as far as it getting worse and worse? Like when did it actually sort of start to curtail? Well, it, I think it infects early season, right? Which we didn't see maybe as much of that this year. Um, but if you have areas like the way Phytophthora spreads is through water, it's uh, umycetes. Um, so as water moves, the bacteria will move. Um, but um, I think once we started getting all of those flooding rains, we saw a lot more of it. One of the hardest distinguishments this year, I think, is the difference between Phytophthora root rot and just physical drown out of the beans. Because in a lot of areas, we had beans sitting in standing water for several days 
or they got washed up and completely coated with mud. And if those beans weren't able to get washed off later, they would have died. And that's not necessarily a root rot. Uh, it's just a plant can't survive when it's underwater. So I think that's something to consider. Definitely a telltale with Phytophthora is those uh, dark kind of reddish brown lesions going from the soil upwards. And then also when it dies, it tends to be more a mid season. So if you're looking for it, you really wanna be looking at it in that July, August timeframe. And it tends to die with the leaves still attached. Um, so that's definitely a telltale sign for me. So this is one of the other key things that I think is really neat about these conversations. And, and Doug, you mentioned the premature death, perhaps in patches, those sorts of things is that there, there, there are clues, right, that we have to be following. Um, and so, I mean, neat point, Johanna, on like it dies, then leaves are attached. Um, when we're looking at some of our canola diseases, if we've got premature death, we've got to figure out why. Um, and, and the same goes for soybeans, of course, right? We often think either uh, white mold or those sorts of things. But um, Jay, can you, I, there we go. Yeah, if you can move to slide three. Three and four, I think, are SDS and soybean cyst nematode. So these are things, yeah, there we go. We're just resizing them on the fly. Um, okay, so sudden death syndrome, how do I know that's what I've got? So that intervenal chlorosis is definitely a telltale. Um, you can see, especially in the picture on the left there, uh, like it's directly between the veins. Usually early on, it might look like modeling. And again, if you split the stem, uh, you'll typically get that like kind of light browning of the pith, but it's, or sorry, of the vascular tissue. But it's one of those things you've got to be looking for early on. It will show up late season, but once your entire field is turning, it's a lot harder to pinpoint those spots. It's a lot easier when you go out in, you know, mid-August and your entire field should be green, finding which spots are yellow and going and looking and trying to figure out what's going on here. Mm -hmm. And then, so the next one is soybean cyst nematode. Um, do these, and this question has come up before, do they always or almost always go hand in hand? Like, can you have soybean cyst nematode and not have sudden death and vice versa? Are they, are they disease buddies? They're definitely buddies. I like that. That's a really good. <laughs> yeah, term. there you go. <laughs> uh, so definitely disease buddies, but they don't always go hand in hand. I did include that picture on the left of the potash deficiency because um, yeah. on the heavier clay soils we have around here, we don't necessarily see as much SDS, but we will see potash deficiency. And oftentimes when we dig that up, that's telltale of soybean cyst nematode. Um, one big thing, you can also get more brown stem rot if you have soybean cyst nematode. It's just those nematodes are doing damage to the roots and they're allowing uh, points for other diseases to come in and infect. So oftentimes one can sort of spur on the other, but it's not, they're not mutually exclusive. Like you can have one without the other. All right. And with that, uh, we're going to head to a quick break and I will be back. We've got a couple important news items to cover, a few things going on that uh, we want to keep you up to date on. So we'll round out the show with our last segment right after this. At Brett Young, we focus on what's real. It's how we became Canada's largest independent seed company. That's why we're asking a real farmer, what do you think of BY6217TF, Brett Young's TrueFlex Canola Hybrid? What's that? <clears throat> BY6217TF, Brett Young's TrueFlex Canola Hybrid with Pod Defender Shatter Reduction Technology and Defender Rated Club Root and Black Leg Resistance. Uh, good yield, yeah. Probably choose it again. Thanks, Chris. Talk to your Brett Young retailer today to see for yourself. Brett Young, distinct by design. What's next for your fields? At Pioneer, delivering industry-leading genetics drives everything we do. From the scientists in the lab to our local teams with boots on the ground, we are determined to get there first. Developing top-performing products, proven in more growing conditions than ever before. Pioneer. What's next happens here. Visit pioneer.com slash Canada to learn more.
Welcome back to Real Egg Radio here on this Tuesday, September 26th. I am your host, Lindsay Smith, and we are rounding out the show with a bit of news you can use. All right. And this segment is brought to you by Kloss. The all-new Kloss Zerion 12 series tractors are redesigned from the ground up to redefine the high-capacity four-wheel drive market. For those who need more than just power, visit Kloss.com. That's C-L-A-A-S dot com. All right, so I did promise some news, of course, for today. Uh, there's a few things going on that I think are pretty important to touch on. So one of the key things is if you've been listening to the show for a while, you'll know that we've been covering this Greenbelt fiasco around the city of Toronto, uh, where Premier Doug Ford reversed course originally uh, and decided to open up huge tracks of the green belt to developers. We've since learned that that entire process was incredibly flawed and there were three developers that basically set were set to get incredibly wealthy over this. Now, the premier then faced a lot of backlash. A couple ministers decided to resign, some staffers resigned, and the auditor general basically wrote a report saying that the entire process was rushed and basically didn't pass the smell test. So uh, Doug Ford last week, as we reported, did actually apologize. So he held a press conference, stood up in front of everyone and apologized for going after the green belts, saying that he had promised he would not. And he broke that promise. He also said that the process was rushed. Now, Doug Ford, the latest in this story is that Premier Ford has actually now said not only will those lands be returned back into the green belt, but the land that was going to be sort of a land swap. So other areas that were going to make up for what was lost in the green belt swap uh, is also going to continue to be included in the green belt. And this is the sort of cherry on top, I suppose. Uh, the premier now says that he plans, his government plans to actually codify. So put into legislation, not just regulation, the boundaries of the green belt and solidify it. Um, and so I saw, uh, I think it was Matt Gurney sort of pointed out that this sort of feels like a, uh, a Doug, it's, it's a legislation sort of to protect Doug Ford from Doug Ford. It kind of does make my head spin, I won't lie, in that, you know, just a few months ago, this was a government that was hell-bent on developing this land. It it was necessary, they said, for the housing crisis or to help solve the housing crisis. Uh, They set it up all, you know, and a whole bunch of their buddies, basically, as we've learned, uh, managed to get a foot in the door and and stood to make billions. Uh, And now they've turned around and said, no, 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 we're not going to do that. We're going to protect it. We're going to protect more and we're going to protect it by legislation. I'm not sure what to make of it all. I would love to hear your feedback. I know that obviously the premier has faced a lot of backlash over this. And this is obviously the government trying to save some face and trying to come back into favor with a lot of the people who have basically seen um, some pretty nasty deeds on behalf of their government. So uh, like it or not, I'm not sure if it's enough uh, for some people, but I did want to point out, and I did write this in the story on realagriculture.com, that at no time so far have I seen, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, have I really seen any discussion on the farmland contained within this green belt uh, as being one of the driving forces for why they're protecting this. So I don't know if that's an omission on purpose or whether that's just where farmland stacks up in the value system. It feels to me like Doug Ford is doing this to save face, not to save farmland. That's my editorializing. Make of it what you will. All right, next story. If any of you have heard of the Living Lab initiative, so this is a federal Agriculture Canada initiative where uh, researchers work with farmers out on the landscape to basically look at the impact of different BMPs, so that's beneficial management practices or best management practices, depends which B you want to use. Uh, and there is a call here in Ontario. There's a call out right now uh, for farmers who may be interested in joining the Living Lab initiative. So uh, if you head on over to Real Ag- agriculture.com. We've got more details there, including a link to where you go. You answer a survey. I'm not entirely sure of the entire process because, of course, we don't choose. Uh, Just letting you know, though. So head over there. There's a survey to fill out and uh, you may be one of the farmers that gets chosen to join the Living Lab Initiative. 
And while you're there, you can check out Kelvin Hefner's latest story, uh, looking at some of the new legislation that could be working its way through uh, in the U.S. regarding the right to repair. So we do have, this is similar to what we have seen that was introduced in the Senate last year. This is now in the House. Uh, Washington Democrat uh, Mary, and I hope I'm saying this right, Glusenkamp Perez introduced the Agricultural Right to Repair Act in the House last week. And this is legislation that could potentially save farmers 4.2 billion per year in direct costs and equipment downtime. Now that's a huge number, but definitely if you've ever been stuck in a field waiting for someone to come and clear an error code or something like that, or if you've ever been frustrated by not being able to access what you need to fix your equipment, this is the legislation that is uh, working to potentially make that easier. So we'll be following that story as well as to where this goes. So, But that does mean that there is legislation now in the House and the Senate in the U.S. Uh, looking to solve this right to repair issue. I did want to touch on just a couple other things uh, from today's show, but also just looking forward. Uh, one of the things that I did bring up today, of course, with the uh, profitable practices and the solar grazing, I did use the S word. Yes, sustainability. And you know what? We recognize that there are people that that word just irks them. Here are some other words that I've got uh, some pushback on. Dr. Dave Hooker, I think, tweeted out today is saying, you know, seeing a job title with su- with sustainable or regenerative in the title sort of just makes them sort of pause a little bit. Would love to know your thoughts on where you stand on using some of these words. What do they mean to you? Are they meaningful or do they just sort of make your skin crawl. Uh, you can zip me an email, lsmith at realagriculture.com, or you can, of course, find us across social media. Um, wanted to hear about that. Now, the other thing I did want to point out as well, as we get through this week, on Monday, I'm going to be hosting The Agronomist, and we are going to be talking about using drones to apply either cover crop seed, seed in general, perhaps fertilizer, and when we might get to a point where we are actually in a on-label application of herbicides or different sprays, because of course right now we don't necessarily have that. But uh, really looking forward to that conversation and would love to know if you have hired someone or if you use your own drone uh, to do any of the cover crop seeding or seeding in general. So there's lots of trials going out this year, uh, seeing lots of it on social media, seeing video. I even saw a drone drone footage of a drone applying seed, which is sort of, you know, out of this world. But uh, these are pretty cool machines. They're quite large compared to what you might think of of with your average drone um, and capable of actually some pretty good capacity and getting out there. So pretty cool. Let us know what you've been doing or what you're most interested in, where you might see some of this technology fitting in. But uh, also please do uh, check it out Monday, 8 p.m. Eastern. You can find us on YouTube, uh, Twitter or X, Facebook, and of course on realagriculture.com slash agronomists. There is, of course, plenty of other things going on in the world, but we're going to park it there for now because we are rapidly running out of time. Your regular Wednesday host, Sean Haney, will be back. He'll be talking markets, of course, tomorrow. Uh, So come on back, 4.30 Eastern, here on Rural Radio Channel 147 to hear tomorrow's show. I am Lindsay Smith. You can zip me an email, lsmith at realagriculture.com, or, of course, you can find us at Real Agriculture on whatever platform you choose. And we're always glad that you join us here on Sirius XM. Okay. I will be back for the Real Ag Issues panel on Friday. I believe this week also means we're going to have a beef market update with Ann Wasco. If I've got my week straight, I gotta tell you, time is flying. By uh, Sunday, we're into October and we are rapidly approaching what Sean Haney would say is the best best holiday of the year. For my American friends, you have to wait till the end of November for your Thanksgiving, but our Thanksgiving happens in October and it is coming up. Um, And I'm pretty sure, and maybe we'll ask him on the issues panel, uh, that uh, Sean is already planning the menu. Let's put it that way. Okay. All right. Thank you everybody for joining me on the show today. It's been my absolute pleasure uh, to join you here. Thank you to all of my guests and to producer Jay for making this all happen. All right. We'll talk to you Friday. Cheers, everybody. Cheers, everybody.